This is importing large data sets into Google Cloud Storage. You're in the right room, and thank you for coming or watching on video. Uh, my name is Brian Dorsey, and I'm a developer programs engineer in developer relations on Google Cloud. I'm Dave Barth. Oh. I'm the product manager on Google Cloud Storage. And let's get started. So uh, very quickly, we're going to go through a tiny bit of background. Um, we're going to run through progressively larger uh, size and scale imports, and then talk about a little bit about how to post-process your data and how to integrate it with your application, and some tips and tricks for all scales of data imports, a special announcement, and then your questions. So let's get started. Um, I expect that, being this is an importing uh, talk, many of you are already familiar with Google Cloud Storage, but I'm just going to run through a few things quickly to kind of uh, make sure we're all coming from the same place. So this is like a whole lot of words. Um, but to summarize, um, Google Cloud Stories has a ton of features. It is basically a container for your data that lives in Google infrastructure and communicates on the internet via HTTP. And we have a bunch of features to make that HTTP communication very efficient uh, and easy to use. But that's the, the main part of it. It's also a project that is under very active development. Um, just in the last year, we've released a whole bunch of features on the bottom there, which could be an entire talk in and of itself, but that's not this talk. We're talking about importing data. Um, but I wanted to take a quick moment and reflect on the awesomeness that is Google Cloud Storage. Um, I think all of you have used applications, and most of you have probably built applications that store their data in files, right? And that works out pretty well. It's easy to get started. And then at some point, you need another disk and then another disk, and another disk. And at some point, you need another machine because you've kind of filled that machine up. And you start adding more machines and a little complexity here and there. And then you decide you need the data somewhere else, or maybe you need another copy of it for redundancy. So that adds some complexity. And it just keeps going. So at some point, you end up with this gnarly knot of uh, interconnected pieces on your architectural diagram. And you're probably familiar with the steps to get you from one place to the other. Um, you've done it enough times that you, as you hit those levels, you know how to address that. But each time you do that, that's an interruption from taking you away from building features for your users, right? And we really think of Google Cloud Storage as a way to kind of trade that knot for a hosted s service from Google. And with a little bit of work integra integrating the APIs on your part, you get to take advantage of the scale of the Google Cloud Platform and all of the redundancy uh, and speed that we provide through the system. Um, it is a solution where you're not going to have to worry about the scale. We have developers who have literally billions of objects in a single bucket and developers with multiple petabytes of data in a bucket. Um, we're ready to, to take your data and run with it. And, help you make your applications amazing. Um, and it's also very close to the rest of the Google Cloud Platform. So it becomes a great gateway to all of the other work you might want to do in BigQuery, Compute Engine, App Engine, and the like. We make that very easy. So let's move on to smaller imports. This is things on the kind of few gigabytes scale or tens or hundreds of files. And in some ways, it's an excuse to talk about GCU. GSUtil. So just a quick question. How many people in the room have heard of GSUtil? And how many people have actually used it? OK, awesome. Um, so quick demo, just to give you a, a sense of GSUtil. I've got a, a directory here that's living actually on a Compute Engine instance, because I'm on a pixel. Um, and I've got some files here that I would like to copy up into Google Cloud Storage. So I can say GSUtil. CP data star to GS some bucket name, and we're going to use IO demo as the bucket name. Um, and it copies one file, but I actually kind of meant to copy all these. And one of the things I'd like to highlight here is GSUtil tries very hard to help you out. And it says, oh, did you actually mean to do a recursive copy there? Um, perhaps you wanted the dash capital R. And in fact, I did. So let's go ahead and do that. And then 
we've now copied all of that data up into Google Cloud Storage, and it's available from anywhere. Um, Cloud Storage also fairly uniquely offers read after write consistency. So as soon as those files are, you get the okay back, they're available to the whole world, exactly that version. Um, quickly, we can go ahead and run an ls command on the same bucket, and we should see a different result here. Look at that. We've got some data up there. Another way to look at the same data is in the Google Cloud Console. Um, this is our new UI for the various Google Cloud Platform APIs. And the cloud storage version of this was, in fact, just released last week. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. If we come down here and switch back and forth between the buckets, we can see the same thing there. So you, you can go ahead and work through the web UI as well. So in a way, um, this talk is going to be a little bit of a love song for GSUtil. So here's how you get it. Uh, the tried and true way is go ahead and download a zip or a tarball and expand, extract that out, and you're good to go. We've also just started a developer preview of the Google Cloud SDK, and that is a collection of tools for cloud storage, compute engine, BigQuery, App Engine, all bundled together in one download and install um, with consistent auth. So you do the authorization once, and it works across all the tools. Um, We've also, uh, for Python programmers, GSUtil is written in Python. It's based, it's open source up on GitHub, and it is mostly based um, at the lower levels on top of the Bodo library for communicating. Um, and if you're a Python developer or you're working in a Python stack, it might make sense to you to use pip install, and we've got an experimental release where you can do that as well. Um, one of the key things GSUtil provides is a conceptual path abstraction. Uh, the, Cloud storage itself is a flat namespace within a bucket. So you can have as many names as you want, but it's a flat space. It is not actually aware of hierarchy. Um, but GSUtil goes and tries to give you a sense of hierarchy, because you're usually going back and forth between file systems and the cloud, and it just makes it easier to say, I want to copy a subdirectory here and that sort of thing. So it tries very hard to give you commands that look like the regular Unix commands you're used to, um, with a couple exceptions around buckets and the like. Uh, it also provides complete feature support for the product. So Google Cloud Storage has many features that are very useful. Uh, for example, hosting static websites directly from Cloud Storage. And you can configure those, those features through extensions, you know, kind of like so. Uh, GSUtil provides those. Um, and for smaller data sets, we can go ahead and just do a straight CP, and that's plenty. It works out great. Um, here's some example command lines of going back and forth between text files and Google Cloud Storage, back, back down. Um, it also, since it's based on the Voto library, it inherits the ability to talk to Amazon S3. So you can, you can use GSUtil to talk to S3 if you're already using S3. And you can also copy back and forth uh, between S3 and Google Cloud Storage. Um, those copies do go through the machine that you run GSUtil on. So. Be aware of that. And also, just as a kind of thought to put in your head, GSUtil is essentially a reference to how to make good applications uh, that talk to Google Cloud Storage. It's kind of a reference implementation of efficiently communicating with Cloud Storage. And if you just go ahead and do a straight GSUtil CP, what's the first like, limit you're going to run into? And I predict it will be network latency. Um, by default, GSUtil does one thing at a time. So if you've got you know, 100 files or 1,000 files, no matter what size they are, it does a round trip, or in some cases a couple, back and forth to the service, and all of those run sequentially. So you can end up taking a lot of time to do that. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, let's do some larger endpoints. This is things uh, in the tens of gigabytes, perhaps the tens of terabytes, and very large numbers of files, you know, in the hundreds of thousands, um, that sort of range. Um, we just add this dash M and it's all good, right? That's easy, we're done. Um, so the dash M stands for multiprocessing 
and multi-threading. And GSUtil actually uses both at the same time to maximize overall throughput. Um, and since it's I.O., like, if you end up needing to, you can dive in um, to the bot.boto configuration file. And there's various things uh, to control GSUtil operation in there. But related to this, you can actually tweak the number of processes and threads uh, if you need to. Um, most of the time, it does a very good job with the defaults. Um, so that was kind of like, look, I just hand wave and it's all fast, right? Um, so what kind of limitations are you going to run into after adding the magical dash M? Um, you're going to run into network bandwidth this time is probably the case. So Google Cloud Storage is hosted on Google Networks, Google Infrastructure, um, and Google Storage Technology. Um, so you're running over the same networks that we use to host YouTube and Gmail and all of the things they may have talked about in other sessions where internet requests go quickly from most users' ISPs directly onto Google Backbone and that communicates on the Google internal network. You get all of those advantages. Um, one side effect of that is gsutil-m can often completely saturate your upload bandwidth all by itself. Um, so in many cases, you can go at the absolute fastest rate that your internet connection can sustain. Um, many of you, however, have very fast networks. And you may first run into disk I.O. as your bottleneck. Um, so if you're copying everything from one drive and you copy a whole bunch of different files, you get a bunch of random seeks and things can end up slowing down that way. So you can end up wanting to use multiple machines to speed things up. And then once you get enough files, there ends up being kind of a coordination and complexity challenges, just in terms of uh, keeping track of which files need to be copied, which ones to copy next, perhaps how to figure out which machines to copy them from, and that sort of thing. So there's one other situation that I wanted to kind of call out here. So the way Dash M makes things faster is by doing more things at the same time. So it's running multiple copies. But what if you really have a single large file that you're trying to speed up? Um, can't use Dash M, right? Or can we? Um, so what you can do is you can actually split your file into multiple pieces and upload those in parallel and ask Google Cloud Storage to reassemble them back into one object. And this uses the Compose feature that was released a few months ago. Um, and it works very, very well. Um, and especially in situations where your data naturally comes from multiple sources, for example, the output of MapReduce jobs or some sort of logging, and you actually want to combine them all into one logical object in the end, uh, it can be very convenient to upload them all separately and combine them actually in the cloud. Uh, one, one limitation I'd like to mention there is the Compose is currently limited to uh, 32 pieces. So you can take 32 objects and combine them into one. Okay, so now we get into enormous imports. Really? <laughs> is it that easy? Um, and we just had a customer go through this process to great success, and I'd like to hand this over to Dave to talk about that. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, walk you through a recent example of a customer that needed to move five, over five petabytes, actually, uh, into Google Cloud Storage. And you know, before I dive into that, Sometimes we throw these big numbers around. I just like to recognize that five petabytes is actually kind of a lot of data, right? You could, you could uh, burn five petabytes of data to just over 100,000 Blu-ray DVDs, or you could s stick that on your TV and watch 100 years of high-def video, um, if you were so inclined. So, you know, five, this is actually a pretty significant migration that this customer went through. And um, this is the architecture of the system that was put together for that migration. And, you know, it obviously is a little bit more complicated than gsutil-m, but I want to point out that you know, the, the, the actual work that's being done, the migration work, are the red boxes in this diagram, and that really is just gsutil-m running across, in this, in this instance, multiple compute engine machines. So what's the rest of it? Well, the rest of it is that coordination complexity that Brian mentioned that you're going, you're going to end up having to deal with if you do really large migrations. In this case, there's, there's two parts to it. So, so breaking it down, there's basically coordinating the migration in order to set up the, the objects that are going to get copied by these compute engine instances, 
copying, doing the copying, and then, and then validating and cleaning up after the copying. For the coordination, that was done with an App Engine app. Um, oh, I should have mentioned that, um, I forgot to mention that the, this customer is actually moving this data from Amazon S3 over to Google Cloud Storage. So, you know, they had uh, requirements to, of, of course, they wanted to move it as quickly as possible. Um, they also wanted to do a live migration um, and, and delete the objects off of S3 as they were being copied over to cloud storage um, so that they, so that they weren't, didn't end up double paying for five petabytes of data right up to the very end. Um, and so the first thing that they did in order to queue up which objects needed to be copied and coordinate the transfer was there's an App Engine app that basically just listed all the objects that needed to be transferred out of uh, the customer's S3 bucket. So they just get a list of object names and they would queue those, queue those up into an App Engine task queue, which is just a standard component that any App Engine developer can make use of. So there's all these objects, there's object names that are sitting in the task queues, and that's basically all the coordination, all the prep that was required before the copying began. The copying itself is basically firing up a, a bunch of Compute Engine instances. Each Compute in, in, Engine instance would pull a handful of objects off of the task queue, and then, and then use gsutil-m to copy those over to cloud storage. I think there were, uh, at peak, um, about 160 Compute Engine instances running in parallel at a given time. And that basically handled the copying aspect of it. Now, the post-processing validation. So what, what was done in this particular case was every time an object completed its copy, a note was made into um, what's, called, what's noted here as a migration bucket which is just a separate Google Cloud Storage bucket that essentially held a series of flat files where each Compute Engine instance, every time it finished copying something, would just, would, just, would just append a note saying this object was copied and this was the hash code that was returned from Google Cloud Storage. And that enabled the customer system to then to go back, read through that list of objects that was in the migration bucket, check that the hash code matched to make sure there wasn't any corruption during the copying, update their, um, their client system update the index in their client system so that the end user computer knew that if it wanted that object, it now could find it over on Google Cloud Storage instead of on Amazon S3. And then go and delete the object from S3. So overall, um, everybody was really pleased with how the migration went. Um, I, I forgot to mention, it was about four billion objects. It was actually, it was significantly over five petabytes of data, but um, you know, there was, a, there was a, a period of setup and testing of the, the system I just described. And then once it got humming, um, about the bulk of the data, about five petabytes, was moved in five weeks. So it was about an average of 12 gigabits per second throughput, um, but regularly peaked above 20 gigabits per second. And, and, you know, perhaps most important, there wasn't any downtime on the client application. And so this addressed a lot of the limits that, that Brian mentioned before. Um, net, network bandwidth, of course, wasn't really a problem um, by virtue of, it, of, of the data being moved from S3 over to cloud, to cloud storage, um, Google has um, you know, quite sufficient peering, um, network peering with Amazon, so that wasn't an issue. And this particular case, Disk I/O also wasn't an issue because we were moving from you know, a, a cloud, another cloud provider that had a lot of scale. Uh, it also helped. Um, uh, we, we, we didn't really worry about it much in any case because the customers' objects, their, their object names were all hashes themselves, so it was really, really easy to partition the data. Um, speaking of partitioning, if you're moving from um, you know, on-premise system, then that's where coordination can come in really handy. You know how your data uh, is stored, and you can, during the coordination step, basically make sure that you partition and sh shard it up so that each compute engine instance that's handling, or, or whatever instance is handling the copy in parallel, um, is, is working on you know, different bits of data at a time so that, you don't, so that no particular disk gets too hot. And the coordination and complexity was handled, of course, by um, building up some of these components on the coordination side, the App Engine instance, in order to queue up the objects um, to be copied. And then this um, post-processing step where the uh, client application was updated to know where to find the object. Um, post-processing is going to be something that's going to tend to be pretty client-specific, use case-specific, but also really, really important. Um, so Brian's going to talk a little, bit about, a little bit more about that. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. OK. So now you've got all this data in your Google Cloud Storage buckets. And presumably, you guys have written some amazing applications that are, like delight your users. So we want to allow you to easily make cloud storage, the processes there, become part of your application. So if you need to transcode the data, 
um, after upload, if you need to make thumbnails, if you need to apply your special sauce, you can do that easily and very quickly. So this is a big wall of, uh, of, detailed, of JSON details here, but essentially we offer a feature called notifications. And you enable notifications on the bucket level, and once you've enabled it, every single change that is made to that bucket, every new upload, every overwrite, every delete, every metadata change, turns into, in addition to actually saving the data and making the change, turns into an HTTP post to any URL you choose. So what you get is details about the change that just happened over HTTP to your app. So that can be an App Engine app, it can be an app that you host anywhere, and very soon after the actual change happens, you'll find out about it. So there's no need to like, write a bunch of polling logic and that sort of thing. It can become more tightly integrated with your application workflow. Um, and this kind of handler doesn't need to be very complex. Uh, you, can rep you, know, you can accept the post, do a little dispatch on what type of uh, event it is, and then pull out the information you care about, buckets, names, what have you, and then do whatever you need to do. So at this point, you could put it in a database, you could put it in a queuing system, um, anything that you can imagine. Like, once it's in a database or a queue, like, as app developers, like, the sky's the limits, right? Like, you can go from there and, and do anything you need. So it's a quick and easy way to get uh, tight integration between cloud storage and the rest of your application. Make it feel more seamless. There's another situation that can arise um, where you need to do bulk changes. So part of the way that cloud storage, Google Cloud Storage, achieves scalability is access control is defined at, at an individual object level. So every single object has access control. Uh, so the, the rights of who's allowed to read it, who's allowed to write it, change it, that sort of thing, right? And if you change your mind about how that should be later, um, you may need to do a bulk update against all of the objects. Um, as an aside, we recommend that you use groups um, for changing, often changing group membership. So you can do that independently of this. But if you make a large scale change to your access control, um, you may run into some challenges because you actually need to do a request response cycle per object. Um, or perhaps if you're doing a large uh, migration or conversion of some sort, you might have a staging bucket that you might need to clear out that has a lot of objects. Um, and one approach that you can, in most cases, I recommend going ahead and just using gsutil-m rm for remove, or uh, we have a command chackle for changing ACLs, and that will cover you in the vast majority of cases. But if you start to get to half a million, a million, couple million objects, um, here's something to look at. Um, the new JSON API, Google Cloud Storage JSON API, supports batching of requests. So what would normally have been a round trip actually becomes one round trip split apart on the other end, and then you get all the responses back in a batch as well. So you can make batches of 1,000 or more uh, requests and responses in one network call, and those all get sent off to cloud storage. Um, this is just kind of a rough idea of what that looks like on, on the wire, but logically it groups the requests into, multiple requests into one. Um, in terms of how you would actually write this code in Python, um, it's relatively straightforward. So we've got um, some setup stuff here. We're doing credentials at the top and that sort of thing. But the meat of it is we've got a list of things that we want to apply a change to, and we iterate through them and call this function I'm going to show on the next slide called batch remove. Um, and I'll have a URL to these slides at the very end of the deck. So all this will be there. And so we call batch remove with our, with our objects. And batch remove. If we take a look right here in the center, this is a normal um, Python client library call that we're just wrapping in this batch system. So we just add each of those calls to the batch and then at the end execute the batch. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to convert code that you already have that is doing it one at a time into a batch call. And that's what this would end up looking like. Um, I know this is kind of a few chunks, so we've got an example up on GitHub that a full example of doing, using this technique. And that's there. And then I'd like to go into some tech, tips and techniques that work across any scale data you've got. So if you've got a little bit of data, you've got a lot of data, a whole bunch of different scenarios. 
uh, first off, is really highly recommend taking a look at the GSUtil help. So just as you'd expect, GSUtil help, and many of you are familiar with command line applications and kind of how obscure their help can be in this, that, and the other. Um, GSUtil has, com let's go ahead and uh, do less here, uh, complete help or not. Um, complete help for all of the, the regular um, commands. And it also has, at the end, these special topics, uh, like access control lists or credentials. Or my favorite, I think, is prod. If you are going to write one of these, go ahead and read this. Each of these is like a little essay in and of itself on best practices for using Google Cloud Storage as part of GSUtil. So you can learn a lot about the product and kind of the best practices by working with GSUtil's help. Highly recommend it. Um, also, um, Dave mentioned it a bit in passing, but one simple technique you can use to kind of address the complexity for medium-sized workloads is to split your work up by prefix. And what that means is your object names, um, you can have them start with you know, a certain character, or if they already start with a certain alphabetic uh, letters, you can use that to your advantage. So if, for example, in like this example, the files you were going to upload were already MD5 hashes, you have a natural, just by starting at the first character, you have a natural split into 16 even groups. And if you needed 256 even groups for some reason, you could use the first two characters and split them out and run them separately. Um, another way to think about this is kind of inverting it. When you're designing your workflow, if you know you're going to want to access these objects by date, for example, put the dates up at the beginning of the object names. And that makes it very easy to separate them out and work with them individually later. And that way you can get all of the you know, log files from the same day, things like that. Uh, another thing that can come up is, you know, this kind of happens at both ends of the scale. If you've got a, a set of files that you're manual, or objects that you're manually trying to work with, and you want to do operations or check them uh, or copy them, um, over and over, or if you want to kind of have an external program create the list of things to work on, you can use this dash uppercase I flag for copy. And in this case, I'm using a text file in and piping it into GSUtil, but the actual source program can be any program you write or XARGs or you know, what have you on the Unix side. So, you can work from a static file or a dynamically generated list of files and pipe them directly through it and still let GSUtil do the, the copying work for you. So that can be pretty powerful. Another thing to remember is the data is actually copying through GSUtil. So you want to run the GSUtil app itself close, in a network sense, to one end of the connection. So in the example Dave talked about, the the connection was actually on Compute Engine. So that's in the Google Cloud, so that's very close to cloud storage. Or you may need to actually um, run it on-premise, like at, at your data center, um, and that may make sense. So that actually only works if you've got enough bandwidth, right? We've kind of hinted at that. So I'd like to hand off to Dave. Right, it only works if you have enough bandwidth, right? And uh, we, we started with a network constraint, and you never get rid of that, right? If you have a poor internet connection between your data and Google, you're going to have a bad time moving that data to Google, right? Um, we're really happy today to announce a workaround for that, and that is uh, offline disk import, which basically works around the internet. And that involves basically writing your data to a, to a disk and shipping it to us at Google to, to upload from our network. We don't necessarily recommend a manila envelope, although I guess it might work just as well. The process is pretty straightforward. Um, format a SATA disk with InkFS. This encrypts the data to so make sure that if it gets lost, um, or protects it basically during, during sh shipment. Uh, copy your data to the disk, mail it to Google. We'll upload it to a Google Cloud Storage bucket that's owned by the customer. We don't touch the data at all. We just upload it and make use of Google's fast network, and then ship the disk back. We're launching this feature in limited preview today, meaning that um, you can sign up at the, link, at the link there to let us know that you're interested in making use of it. And 
um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take applicants as we, as we can to scale it up. Uh, right now it's only available for uh, customers that are located in the United States. If you're an international customer, please do fill out the, the interest form anyway and let us know because we will be definitely expanding this internationally in coming months and, and that may help us prioritize a little bit. And uh, the price is a flat $80 per disc. Um, we don't charge um, any, any other fees than that beyond the usual storage fees that are associated with any kind of Google Cloud Storage usage. Okay, thank you very much. And I wanted to kind of highlight a few of the, uh, the things that have happened in the last year. So um, several of these I've talked about in the talk and a few of them I haven't. Um, you can also enable versioning on any bucket. So as things change, you keep the old versions around. Um, we announced durable reduced availability storage for situations where, like backup in particular, where you're willing to trade a little bit of availability for a lower price. Um, and we lowered prices by 30% in the last year. And also kind of throughout the talk, um, if you're paying careful attention, I did actually reference several things that have been announced recently. So the, the Cloud Console is one of them that was actually just released last week. We also, uh, I talked about the Compose command, which allows you to combine multiple objects in the cloud. Uh, notifications, which I mentioned in the post-processing, our new JSON API um, that's been out for many months but just went through a significant revision and improvement um, and went to, the correct term is preview. Um, and that is now available and you know, our intent is to make that a generally available uh, feature. Um, and so we highly recommend you take a look at that. Um, it's very good. And offline disk import. So to wrap up a little bit, um, we've, got, we've talked about many tools to, and techniques to help you get your data into Google Cloud Storage. And Google Cloud Storage is a very reliable, efficient, fast place to store your data. And we look forward to seeing the applications that all of you build on top of Google Cloud Storage. Um, we'd like to move into Q&A. Um, and as we do that, I'd like to invite two other folks up to the stage from the Google Cloud Storage team. Um, we have, yeah, yeah, we'll bring them up here. And go ahead and line up at the mics if you have questions for us. Um, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Uh, hi. Hi, I'm Lamia Youssef, and I'm the BM on the Google um, import disk. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Aikas, and I'm the tech lead for the cloud storage. Okay, first question. Hi. Um, with regards to small and medium-sized uploads, is there a reason why I would not want to use the Dash M if I want to get that smaller amount in in a multi-threaded fashion, aside from the uh, limitations or problems that were mentioned with the large data structures? No, in most cases you can, you can use Dash M in almost any scenario. So yeah, so go ahead no and use Dash M. Okay. Yep. All right, that's all. Hi. Uh, I work in the industrial electronics sector and uh, we see a lot of the times people trying to pull information from uh, PLCs or different types of servers so that they can put into the cloud for redundancy. Okay. Do you see this addition of the offline import uh, being helpful in that instance where they're going to be trying to take previous data and put it to the cloud so that they can still have that redundancy for previous instances? I would, I would say definitely yes, since it's going to be uh, much faster to get the data into the cloud. However, if it's on, already online and uh, the size of the data is not very large, then maybe the online version is going to be much faster. So it depends on the size of the data, definitely. Yep. It, it really comes down to the, the amount of data you have and the bandwidth of your network connection. And when those, and the time, how long you, need, you have before you need the data online. So if those don't work out, disk import becomes a great choice. Hi, uh, do you have any suggestions for best practices on getting uh, uh, data and logs out of App Engine into cloud storage? So I think for that, like the very best thing to do is to recommend um, visiting the Cloud Sandbox. Um, we'll have some more App Engine experts there. Um, but I will kind of just hint that there are some, some tools for getting um, 
exports of the App Engine data store directly into cloud storage, and you can also use all the regular cloud storage APIs directly from App Engine code. So. Is there any way to do um, streaming uploads or to append to files without resorting to combine? Yeah. I'm sorry, streaming uploads doing what? Um, streaming uploads or appending to files that are already uploaded. Yeah, so you can't do an append right now um, forever and ever, but what you can do is you can use the object compensation up to a limit. So if, for example, you're doing logs and you want to snapshot logs like an hourly basis or so, you could do that up to 32. But uh, other than that, append support is, is just general append is not supported. Um, and one workaround for that, like uh, resume. Oh, I don't. Sorry. No, uh, you can, you can, you can. Um, resumable uploads. Um, you know, for a limited time frame, you can actually kind of leave a resumable upload open, and you can kind of keep trickling the the upload up to the s service. Um, but the objects only become available once it's completed. So if you need to use the data in between, you have to use composition. How, how long can that take? What's the maximum time? About a week. Try to keep it under a week. Um, can you say anything about uh, compression, uh, built-in support, GSUtil? Um, I don't think it does any support uh, encryption by default. Uh, it's encryption, I mean compression by default, but um, you can certainly go and zip the data, gzip it before you upload it. Yep. Hi. Hello. Um, my name is Jeremy. I work for EditShare. It's a company that does high-speed local storage for, um, you know, video production, that sort oh, of great. thing. Oh, great. Um, and we've considered um, using cloud services um, for some of our customers. Um, and even <clears throat> for these customers who are willing to, you know, just mail in a disk and, you know, upload it to the cloud, yep. um, one key feature which they require is being able to um, essentially get at parts of that data oh. quickly. Um, so how exactly would I do the equivalent of a seek uh, um, using, and, you know, just copying out part of a file? You can basically use uh, range gets. So you can, you can basically say, give me the byte ranges that you want out of the full object. And is that something I can do in parallel for lots of yep. objects at once? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Super. HTTP range header. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we, there's no more people up there questions, but we'll just say that we will also be at the Cloud Sandbox with uh, Google Cloud Storage specific office hours tomorrow afternoon. Um, I think maybe check the schedule for the exact time. And thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you.